On behalf of PNC Bank, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. At PNC, we embrace and promote diversity and inclusion as core elements of our core values and culture. We recognize that it is bigger than any single person or group, and when coupled with collaborative teams and inclusive leaders, has far-reaching impact. Taking the time to join us today indicates that you're interested in learning more about the roles and responsibilities necessary to create more opportunities for positive understanding and change. Thank you for showing up to prioritize diversity, equity, and inclusion today. Thank you also to the Greater Wyoming Valley Chamber for creating the series and to the phenomenal presenters for sharing their time and expertise to help foster a more inclusive culture in our community. And it's now my pleasure to introduce um, our speaker today, Khadija Means. Khadija is a diversity, equity, and inclusion strategist and serves on the board of directors for Nonviolent uh, Communication Santa Cruz. She integrates the principles of nonviolent communication and harm reduction into anti-oppression education. Khadija has worked with organizations in the private and public sectors to facilitate conversations around gender, sexuality, race, and other topics of systemic oppression. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Khadija at this point. Thank you. Hi, thank you so, so much for such a warm welcome. I'm excited to talk a little bit about nonviolent communication and what I do as a DEI strategist with you all today. So let's just get started. Um, today, we're gonna talk about nonviolent communication. This presentation is called Say What You Mean with Khadija Means. <laughs> so uh, what is nonviolent communication? It's Marshall Rosenberg's groundbreaking framework for connection. Um, Nonviolent communication is about honoring boundaries. It's about recognizing who your audience is and how to reach them appropriately. It's, it's partially about utilizing um, observations as a tool to uh, name people's specific behaviors in order to ask them um, to change or to uh, honor our requests. And it's about closing the gap between our intended outcome and our actual impact. Um, and so today we're going to learn uh, a little bit about nonviolent communication and how it can be transformative in the workplace and beyond. So the four key principles of nonviolent communication are observations, needs, feelings, and requests. And you saw requests squiggle on up there uh, in the animation because it is super exciting and a way for us to combine all three of uh, the beginning principles into a final uh, request to meet our needs. Um, so we're going to talk about what an observation is, what the universal human needs are, what feelings are and how we respond to our environment, and how to make requests of others. Oh, I need to open up the chat so that I can see if you all are um, messaging me. And feel free to use the chat to um, enter some things. Actually, I would like you all to practice using the chat right now because we're going to talk about empathy and honesty. So before I give you my definition of empathy, I want to hear from you. What is empathy? So open up the chat bubble and type in uh, what you think empathy is. Don't be shy, I wanna hear from you. Understanding others' viewpoints and backgrounds, why they come to the conclusions they come to. Empathy, being able to relate to someone's situation and or validate their feelings. Uh, seeing the world through another person's eyes, emotions. Um, another one I see is empathy is treating people kindly and generously. I love the use of the word generous here. Um, we're gonna talk more about observations versus, versus evaluations. Um, generous can sometimes be an evaluate, evaluatory statement, but um, I like it here because we're really trying to see what's alive in someone else. Um, so my definition of empathy is an awareness of what is alive in others. What's coming up for us? What are we feeling? Uh, what are others feeling? Um, and trying to use all the tools that we have to recognize what is alive in someone else. Um, and one way we can do this is by asking questions, 
um, and trying to draw out what the other person is feeling and needing. The next thing I have up here is honesty. Um, and this one's a simple one. Thank you all for practicing in the chat with me and don't be shy. I'm happy to read your messages as we go on. Um, so honesty is a little more straightforward. I define it here as presence, an understanding of what is alive in us. Um, this can be really challenging because we spent lots of our life uh, denying that we are the authority of ourselves. We learn over uh, long periods of time from our teachers, from our own parents, uh, from the world, that they might know who we really are better than we do. Um, I, one example that comes to mind is with children, uh, someone might break a glass and someone will point to them and say, you did that on purpose. Uh, well, how can we know what someone's done on purpose? Um, we can't know other people's intentions. We can make assumptions about them, but we can't truly know without asking them. Um, and so honesty here is about honoring yourself and about recognizing what is truly alive in you. What are you feeling and needing? Um, so how is that landing for you all? Let me know in the chat. Does that definition of honesty resonate with you? Do you have any questions? Hannah says that resonates with me. Thank you, Hannah. All right, let's keep going. I need to see your faces. I'm gonna put you in gallery view, but in this corner, hello. Hi everyone, let's keep going. So now let's talk about a tool that we use to discuss nonviolent communication and help us categorize our intentions. Um, on the left-hand side, we have Jackal. And the jackal's intentions are to uh, blame, to diagnose, to deny the choice of another, to make demands, and maybe use shame or guilt to try to coerce someone into changing their behavior. Um, the focus of the jackal intentions are to punish someone for what they've done or to control them. Uh, do any of these sound like effective ways to communicate with people? Probably not. Um, there are definitely things that we've learned to do. Um, but they're certainly not, um, they're certainly not what we want to use in nonviolent communication. Um, so what might we use? What kind of intentions might we want to have if we're using nonviolent communication? Well, we want to use giraffe intentions and giraffe uh, intentions are the language of the heart, basically, um, to observe, connect, understand, and to recognize, uh, or to honor mutual trust in a space. Um, and so when Marshall Rosenberg, the founder of nonviolent communication, is talking about uh, the jackal and giraffe intentions, um, he is talking about coming into places and into, comp uh, into complex situations and just everyday life, always centering empathy, trying to sense your own feelings and needs and sense the feelings and needs of others in order to uh, reduce harm and reduce the potential for harm. Um, and so when we use the jackal intentions, we quickly fall out of nonviolent communication, which we're going to learn more tools about nonviolent communication in a second. But I like to bring uh, the binary of jackal giraffe to us just because it helps us place uh, where we might be feeling and what our intentions are when we come into a conflict situation. So on the left side, we have um, the internal blame, which is to uh, jackal intentions, which is to blame yourself. Oh, I shouldn't have done this, or to blame someone else. Uh, they, they're, it's their fault. They shouldn't have done this. Uh, and instead, on the right, we have to empathize with ourselves. You know, um, I was feeling really scared, and I did something I should, I, I regret doing, or I wish I didn't do. Or um, I see this person is really angry at the circumstances. Maybe I, sh maybe I can give them some space today. Or I can understand why I feel very angry about this situation as well. Uh, let's try to recenter and talk about it again. Um, empathy and honesty and grace. Lots of patience, lots of grace. I see a question from Jack M. Thanks so much for the question. It says, uh-oh, the boxes are blocking. Can everyone see? Cool. Why is diagnosis and jackal? How is that different than observer understand? Jack M., thank you for the assist. Let's talk a little bit about it. Really quickly, um, an overview of Nonviolent communication and what we'll learn today is that it focuses on observations 
instead of evaluations or judgments or diagnosis. Um, we don't want to diagnose the other person. We want to observe what's literally happening in a situation. Let them know how we're feeling about it. Let them know what we need or what need is unmet for us. And then ask them if they're willing to change or willing to do something different to help us meet our needs. Um, we're going to get into what an observation is versus an evaluation in the next set of slides. But this is just a quick overview of those things. Thanks so much for that question, Jack. Don't hesitate to ask more questions in the chat. Uh, the next thing we have up here is avoiding criticism, criticism, judgment, and blame. When we criticize or judge someone, uh, it immediately disrupts our opportunity to connect with them. Um, it's one of the reasons we, uh, we block um, viewing other people's humanity. Uh, we vilify others and we create distance between what we will do and what they're doing, um, or what we would do and what they're doing. Um, and that, and severing the empathy that way, uh, really hinders us from connecting with folks and from us getting our needs met in the end. Um, and so it's a, it's a distraction and we want to stay focused on, you know, really communicating what's alive in us and having the other person um, recognize our humanity and be willing to do something new because uh, they are willing to, um, because they want to do it and not because they've been coerced into doing it uh, because of blame or criticism on our part. And the last thing that we'll talk about is resisting uh, an implication of a normal or right way of doing things. We want to kind of suspend morality temporarily so that we can get to a place where we're focused on uh, what we are feeling and needing and what the other person is feeling and needing as well. So that brings us, that sentiment brings us right to one of my favorite quotes by the poet Rumi, which is, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there is a field. I will meet you there. I hope today that we can be in this field that Rumi imagines, where out beyond the ideas of uh, who is correct, who has the right way to approach life and communication versus, and who has the wrong way, um, we can suspend those temporarily to focus on, you know, seeing a new way uh, or to just connect with what I have uh, decided to be one of the most important things in diversity, equity, and inclusion is being able to empathize. Um, and while I don't think that systemic oppression is um, the root cause is a lack of empathy, I do think empathy can help heal the wounds of uh, systemic oppression. Um, so let's learn a little bit more about nonviolent communication and how to uh, apply it on a day-to-day -day basis. So Jack, here we go. We're gonna talk about observations versus evaluations. An observation is something that we can notice um, if there was a camera in the room, a camera and a mic in the room, we could hear um, what is happening and we could see what is happening. Um, that is what an observation would be, something that's specific. Um, so these are my little brothers, Ajani. Ajani does not turn on his camera for school before 10 a.m. Um, he'll be present, but will his camera be on? Absolutely not. Um, so this is a specific thing. Ajani does not turn on his camera before 10 a.m. An observation is also free of judgment or criticism. Khalil writes his presentations one hour before presenting. Now, uh, if we change the tone here and I say, oh, Khalil writes his presentations one hour before presenting, that might infuse a little bit of judgment. Uh, but if I try to stay neutral uh, and we look at the specific words here, um, this is not an evaluation. It's just what's literally happening. And then lastly, an observation needs to detail a behavior. You arrive after the start time once a week. Um, and so on the other side, let's contrast these observations with some evaluations. We have a failure to be specific or generalizing. For example, black women are, are loud. Um, so on the left, we have something that is specific. Ajani does not turn in his camera, turn on his camera before 10 a.m. And then we have a failure to be specific. Black women are loud. Are all black women loud? Certainly not. We can't make a generalization about an entire race of people. Um, but we can a race and gender of people. Um, but what we can say is, uh, Khadija used a louder volume than I've heard anyone else use for an hour in our conversation today. 
Um, and that's specific. I'm Khadijah and maybe I'm speaking loudly, louder than you've ever heard. Uh, and so that would be specific and talking about me. And this is one way that we can um, interrupt bias is by being specific. Um, so instead of saying uh, immigrants don't clean their yards, uh, we would say the immigrant family that lives next to me, I've never seen them mow their lawn or I've never seen them clean their, their yard, which is specific. It's about the immigrant family next to us, not all immigrants. Um, the next one is free of judgment and criticism. So we have um, on the other side for evaluations, a judgment, Khalil procrastinates. So instead of saying Khalil procrastinates, which is a judgment, um, that adjective slash adjective slash adverbs that add um, an evaluation, uh, we want to avoid. So instead of saying he procrastinates, we'll say what's on the left. Next, we have confused predictions with certainty. They won't complete that project on time. Well, we don't know what they will do. Uh, we, uh, we could say that they said they won't complete it on time. We could say, I think they won't complete it on time and own our evaluation. Uh, but we can't pretend that this evaluatory statement is in fact an observation. Um, so that doesn't mean we can't have opinions in nonviolent communication. It just means we want to focus on um, connecting with the other person, listening to what they're actually saying or doing. Um, and if someone says they won't complete that on time, um, th we are interrupting our opportunity connect to connect and we're misrepresenting the situation because we don't know uh, what they will or will not do in the future. We're just checking the chat really quickly. And the last one is a hidden evaluation. Jamie is aggressive. Um, this is also an evaluation, even though it seems like an observation because we're saying someone's aggressive, that must be obvious. Uh, but this is not detailing a behavior. It's not free of judgment or criticism and it's certainly not specific. Um, so Jamie is throwing uh, tissue boxes across the office <laughs> would be specific, free of judgment and Christmas, <laughs> Christmas criticism and it's detailing a behavior. Um, we can add, I think, it's my opinion and my view uh, to these, and then we're owning those evaluations, and that's more than allowed. Uh, but when we're making an observation, we really wanna stick to the three on the left. Does that answer your question, Jack? And how is everyone else feeling about the pacing right now? Does it make a difference that you include a racial or gender marker in an observation? For example, saying the immigrant family next door hasn't cleaned their yard versus the family next door hasn't cleaned their yard. It depends on the situation. Um, in a situation where it is necessary to, uh, to label the group you're talking about, um, that for the story to make sense, then you absolutely should. When we're adding things in, when it's not relevant, uh, then we should question our intentions there. Um, so um, if you're telling a story about uh, my DEI work and uh, some of my community organizing from years ago, and you're saying, you know, Khadijah has been organizing for 20 years in, Oakland, in the Oakland community, helping kids, uh, that wouldn't be accurate to the work that I've done. Um, I've been helping black kids specifically uh, because of um, systemic oppression and systemic racism that affects black children in Oakland. Um, so there it is important to, to mention um the race of someone where uh whereas a situation like the example i gave we didn't really need to include the immigrant family in the observation thanks for bringing that forward all right so it's time for us to do some practice you thought this was not <laughs> you thought there was no homework there's always homework here we go so on the right hand side we have an evaluation and on the left, there's an observation, but I want you all to take your hand at writing one to yourself. You don't have to write them in the chat, but you're welcome to share if you'd like. This is just practice for you. So on the right-hand side, we have, you are too generous. How might we transform this evaluation into an observation? I'll give you 30 more seconds before I show you the results. And you're welcome to put them in the chat as well.
So on the right, we have You Are Too Generous. And on the left, we have a couple of submissions. Angeline says, I've observed you helping or giving to blank um, or X number of people this week. Sorry, X number of people this week. That would be an excellent observation. You give your time and en energy to so many. Well, Lauren, let's workshop this a little. Um, we are making an observation, so we want to be specific. Uh, you give your time. Uh, how much time? To who? Um, and energy to so many. How many people? Just because tone can get tricky here, so we want to get the wording correct. And this is not because we have to get every single word right, but because we're trying to practice um, what a true observation will look like. So in real life, you should tailor, you should you're welcome to tailor your um, communication in a way that is best suited for you and the folks that you're talking to, like we said in the beginning, knowing your audience. Um, but uh, I want you to practice using this format. When I see you counseling strangers through their grief, I think you are being too generous. Um, so here in the beginning, we have a observation when I see you counseling strangers through their grief and this is specific you know I must be talking about a specific situation um, and then the I think uh, loops in our evaluation so I can still say my opinion about something but I can't let it masquerade as an observation let's do one more we have Lexus complains a lot what's a way that we can transform this and thank you again for your submission Lauren Lexus complains a lot. How might we transform that into an observation? I think Lexus complains a lot, Jack says, question mark. That is our ownership of an evaluation. That's true. Um, so that would be acceptable, uh, but not as an observation, but as an ownership of the evaluation, I'd allow that. What's another way that we can talk about what Lexus does? I'll give you an example. Lexus told me about the same problem 10 separate times. Woo, that might be exhausting. Um, Lexus has voiced their opinion at least three times this week on how the vending machine in the break room doesn't work. Excellent, Hannah. You nailed it. <laughs> Not too late. Thank you so much. So I'll do a couple more. Tyler is lazy. Not only is this ableist, label, lazy would be an ableist slur, but it's also uh, not accurate to what Tyler's doing. What is Tyler doing? Five on our team spent two hours on the project. Tyler spent 20 minutes. Now, maybe Tyler is like Whitney Houston. He writes that song or they write that song in 20 minutes, you know, or they finish the project in 20 minutes, but perhaps not. Um, and so I could understand why this observation would leave our feelings out. We haven't gotten to say how it makes us feel that Tyler has only spent 20 minutes. We haven't gotten to say what we need from Tyler instead. Um, and we're gonna learn how to do that next. But this is the very first step is to make that observation strong and clear. Five on our team spent two hours on the project. Tyler spent 20 minutes. I feel upset because I spent hours and I think that we should all be contributing the same amount um, of time at least. Uh, is it possible for uh, you to talk to Tyler? Or is it possible, Tyler, for you to uh, spend more time on this project? Um, and so that's how we'll add up all of the observations, feelings, needs, and requests in the future. But until then, um, let's keep going through the evaluations. The last one is, you're not listening. This is a classic one uh, in, in our personal lives. You're not listening to me. Uh, I see you texting when I'm talking to you. Or I see that you're on TikTok. Or I see that you're slacking a coworker during our Zoom call. And then we'll follow that up with feelings, needs, and requests. Any questions about evaluations and observations? Okie dokie. Let's talk about needs. So Marshall Rosenberg 
uh, does a beautiful song on acoustic guitar about the universal human needs. Uh, it's a little bit about um, the things that we all feel, the things that we all need to have a full, uh, happy, uh, tranquil life. I cannot sing. So instead, I'm going to take a moment to do a quick interpretive dance um, about the universal human needs. I'm not going to do an interpretive dance. If you bought that, I love you for it, but we are not doing that today. <laughs> Let's talk about the universal human needs. So we have autonomy, connection, play, meaning, peace, honesty, and physical well being. Underneath these, we have um, these are kind of the umbrellas of human needs, and there are so many more. You can find a list of these on CNBC. Um, I can send out some resources after this um, or give them to GWV so they can send them out. Um, under connection, we have belonging, stability, and trust. Oh, and we have many more human needs. Uh, so you can look under here um, and see them. There's huge lists of needs. I can recommend many books on this topic, um, but I will have to send those out in the resource list. Thank you for that question, Jack. Um, and physical well being, rest, water, movement. Um, so there's many needs, and we want to be in touch with which needs of ours are met or unmet at any given time so that we can recognize what's coming up for us in a situation. Um, and remembering that other folks share these same human needs. We all want to feel respected. We want to feel heard. We want to feel, um, excuse me, we want to feel uh, celebrated. We want to feel cared for. Um, and we want to learn how to recognize everyone's humanity and give them an opportunity to, uh, to get their needs met as well as meet our own. So let's talk about feelings. Now, this is one of my favorite things because it has made. Yes, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is relevant in this framework. Um, we can talk more about that in the Q&A. Please bring that up again. Feelings versus non-feelings. Sorry to interrupt my own thought. Here we go. <laughs> feelings versus non-feelings. I love this conversation because it's one of the things that stood out most to me when I was first learning about nonviolent communication. Um, have you ever heard someone say, I feel ignored? Um, maybe you have. I can't see if you're shaking your heads, but um, I'll trust that you are. Maybe you've, you've heard someone or you've said it yourself. I feel ignored. Uh, but can we feel ignored? Sometimes when someone's ignoring you, um, and I'm using that in air quotes because that would fall into the non-feelings category. When Sometimes when someone's ignoring you, you're happy. I don't want to talk to this person all day. I'm so excited they didn't even reach out to me. Um, but sometimes when we're feeling ignored, we're feeling sad or we're feeling hurt. Um, uh, that we haven't talked to the person that we were excited to speak to or we are needing to talk to uh, in the workplace. Um, and so feelings words are words that communicate what is alive in us specifically. Um, and non-feeling words are interpretations of other people's behavior. Um, so in the ignored example, if I said, I feel ignored, that word is telling me, telling you more about what I think you're doing to me, ignoring me, than it is about what um, you're actually feeling and what's alive in you, that you're feeling sad and hurt because I didn't reach out to you on your birthday or whatever else. So some feeling words are vulnerable, angry, engaged, grateful, connected, disconnected. Those are feelings. Um, and there's an index of feelings also on CV and C nbc.org uh, and also um, I like to use the empathy apps um, which I'll actually put in here in the chat actually I'll put that in the chat later because I want to make sure that you go specifically to the empathy apps but there is a website where you can click on um, a, in, a your initial feeling which might be a non-feeling word like insulted um, and you'll click on insulted and it'll show you the feelings behind that insulted feeling. Maybe you're feeling angry or hurt or sad or criticized uh, or criticized would be a non-feeling as well. Um, and then uh, it will also show you the need that's not being met so that when you're coming to someone to ask them uh, to help you meet your needs, you have that specific example ready. 
this is a feelings wheel. This is one way that you can find feeling words. Um, uh, there's many free ones online. Uh, I like this one. Um, I had a partner who hated this feelings wheel. Um, so what works for some folks doesn't work for others. Uh, take what works for you and leave what doesn't. Um, but the feelings work, uh, wheel can be nice if you have kind of more abstract feelings, like I'm feeling energetic. Where does that land? You know, it lands in the happy segment. So you're feeling happy. You're feeling good. Um, so it can, it can help with things like that. We are going to talk briefly about why nonviolent communication can be so empowering uh, in my kind versus nice, all about boundaries anecdote. Um, so we all know a nice person. This person is always saying yes to every opportunity. Uh, maybe they are sacrificing their lunch breaks to help others on a project. Um, they are always uh, saying yes you almost never heard them say no. And if you have heard them say no, they later say yes, or they try to come through no matter what. Um, and this can leave people burnt out. Um, maybe they're saying yes to us at work, but at home they have no energy for anyone else, uh, for their families or themselves. Um, they're burnt out. Um, and this can turn into resentment. Um, and so those nice folks, you know, they wanna commit to everything, but maybe now that makes them late to everything because something uh, they're overbooked um, or they've uh, overcommitted. Uh, but kind people have an awareness of the boundaries uh, that will help them regulate their world. They have an awareness of what's alive in them and what they're needing to manage their schedules. And they are able to set clear boundaries. Uh, this can make them more reliable because um, when they say yes, you know that they can show up on time and show up with the presence and readiness and energy um, because of their ability to say no to other things. And they're able to honor themselves by communicating their needs. Um, so this is my uh, kind of quick dichotomy of the kind versus nice. Um, we don't wanna be nice people who say yes to everything. We wanna be kind people who are able to show up for our coworkers, colleagues, and uh, family members and ourselves because we have clear boundaries. Saying no and taking care of yourself so that you can show up fully is super important and super helpful um, in the workplace. Checking the chat, we're good. Now, the moment we've all been waiting for, at least I certainly have. Let's talk about requests. How to ask for what you really need. So on the left-hand side, we have a quick example of what a request is. Um, and, or how it feels to receive a request um, and also how it feels to receive a demand um, and what might happen. So on the left, we have a request. The speaker only wants compliance if the listener is willing. Um, so we talked in the beginning about how people might use shame or guilt to coerce someone into doing something um, or try to force them to do something. Uh, but that is not a free choice for someone. Um, and so using nonviolent communication, we make requests of people to always recognize their humanity and their autonomy as human beings. Um, they have a choice in anything they do. Um, and it doesn't seem that way in the workplace sometimes because a project has to get done, an email needs to get sent. Um, and you might feel like, uh, you know, this has to be done. It is job critical. Um, and that may be true, um, but we still can frame things as a request. Um, and make it clear what the consequences are um, for the role if that's not met. But we always wanna recognize folks' autonomy. Next, we have the speaker empathizes with what the person is wanting instead of hearing it as rejection. So <clears throat> if you ask me to stay late for um, an extra meeting um, and I say, I cannot stay late today, I'm so tired. Um, this doesn't work for my schedule at all. And in the future, I really need a week heads up about staying an extra hour after work. Um, a person who is ready to empathize with me hears that I'm tired. I um, mean, it's not, it does not internalize that as a rejection or um, as a disrespect to the person, but recognizes that I am just trying to honor my own needs. Um, now, as I said earlier, some things are uh, critical to your role um, and, uh, we have to make those expectations clear for folks so that they can make choices 
uh, based on what they need. And then next we have response to non-compliance expresses recognition of listeners' feelings and needs. So in my example I just made about staying late, uh, the person who is listening to me say, I'm just, I'm sure I cannot, uh, they might respond by saying, you know, um, I definitely am hearing that you're tired um, and I recognize that you need some, uh, you need to leave at the agreed upon, the early, agreed upon time, the agreed upon time. Are y'all understanding me here? Send me a message in the chat to let me know how the pace is for you. And any questions that might be coming up about requests or demands. On the right side, we have a demands. So the listener either submits or rebels. You all might be familiar with the passive, um, assertive, aggressive com communication. Uh, Nonviolent communication would live in that assertive column. Um, I love um, talking about the submission or rebellion uh, using Netflix. Uh, so now that we're most of us are working from home still, uh, you have Netflix lingering in the background. You could go to it at any time, but you have things to do. You have to be working, right? Uh, because that's part of your agreement if you are employed. So you're supposed to be working during the workday and um, there's an outside authority that's saying, you know, you must work. Um, instead of thinking, of your choice to work as I have to do this. Uh, thinking about how you choose to do something because it serves your values and needs. I like to have shelter, food, and water. And so I choose to work in order to meet my needs for shelter, food, and water. Um, when I don't think of it that way, when I don't think of it as an autonomous choice uh, for myself, I might think of it as, oh, I have to work, but you know, instead I'm going to watch Netflix. That's me rebelling against something that's going to help me meet my values and needs because I'm thinking of it as an obligation, as a have to instead of a choice. Um, or a submission example would be, you know, um, oh, I don't want to do this, but I have to do it because I, uh, because they're telling me to, or because that's what we do in our society. Um, and so my my quick reframe of that is. I'm choosing to work today because I care about my apartment and cat. I don't have a cat, but I just thought it would be nice for us to pretend I had a pet. <laughs> the next is speaker interrupts non-compliance with rejection. Uh, interprets, I'm sorry, not interrupts. Speaker interprets non-compliance with rejection. Um, so instead of hearing, oh, this person is not willing or able to do this, we hear that as, oh, they don't care about us or they don't care about our project or work, um, and we want to frame that as empathy um, and not hearing it as rejection. So when someone says no to us, thank you for taking care of yourself, or thank you for taking care of, uh, thank you for communicating your needs. Um, and then adding a follow-up, if we really do uh, need something different from them. Thank you for taking care of your needs. Is it possible for us to renegotiate how this might go or something else? Um, and lastly, if the request is not complied with, the speaker will criticize, judge, or guilt trip. Um, so that's the uh, demand side. Um, this commonly looks like, um, I can't believe you wouldn't do blank, um, or it's a shame that you didn't blank. Um, those are common ways that people guilt trip or criticize. Here's a little bit about request language. It should be clear concrete, current, and use positive action language. Um, so an example of, a, here's a couple example requests. Would you be willing to train this new employee for two weeks? It's clear, we know what's being asked of us. We want to know if this person's willing to train a new employee for a specific time frame. Are you available for a chat about last night's historic verdict? Yesterday, Derek Chauvin uh, was found guilty for uh, murdering George Floyd. Um, so would you be willing to talk about that with me? Asking uh, consent applies outside of our personal lives. We want to remember to ask folks uh, if they have space or willingness to talk with us about um, challenging topics. So before you ask, or before you just open up a chat <laughs> about uh, last night's verdict, asking, you know, hey, I'm interested in talking about this with you. Would you be willing to talk about it with me or would you be comfortable uh, with talking about it um, today or tomorrow? Um, just checking in with folks. Then we have, is it possible for you to look over this memo once more before we send it out? 
I used to have TPS reports there, but the audience was too young to know about office space. Gosh, dang it. <laughs> then it's how did that um, how did that quote, we're listening and learning email land for you? Um, this is the era of people trying to have genuine empathy for horrible situations um, in our world, but sometimes they miss the mark with emails that do not actually portray genuine outrage or empathy, uh, but rather just have a corporate, uh, corporate, we're here for you sentiment. Um, and so asking someone, how did that land for you? Or the way that I talked to you all about the chat, how is the pace right now? Just checking in, using the hows, the uh, hows, what, what's going on? How, how did that land for you? Um, just always asking questions and using curiosity as a major tool to connect with folks, giving everyone an opportunity to share what's coming up for them. Empathy and requests. So that was a little bit about the request language. I'm gonna give you a sentence frame after this, but I wanna also talk about what to do when we know nonviolent communication because we've just taken this awesome, you know, hour out of our day to sit with Khadija, hear a little bit about um, nonviolent communication, uh, but we take this to our workplace or we take this home with us um, and we try to empathize with someone and they're not empathizing with us. They're trying to um, convince us to change our behavior or they're trying to, you know, interrupt our empathy and tell us we aren't genuine. Uh, so when we are coming with nonviolent communication and someone else is not able to meet us there, we want to use empathy to try to notice what's coming up for them. So here I have notice what others are observing. Um, and so are you reacting to my tweet? If someone comes to us and they're like, I can't believe you would write that. Let's ask a question to find out what are you observing? What is the thing that's coming up for you? Next, consider how they're feeling and the needs that might be producing those feelings. Are you feeling annoyed because you want more appreciation for your work than you received? We want to be careful about tone. I don't know if I would want to say it the way I just did. But you know, listening to someone, if someone comes into the room and they say, I can't believe no one cares about me or here, um, or no one even came to my presentation, um, we want to try to sense what someone is, uh, what's coming up for someone else and ask them questions. How are you feeling right now? Or what's coming up for you? Are some safe choices? And if you're feeling ready to determine what's going on because maybe you know this person well, you can ask them, are you feeling annoyed? Um, so being more specific, uh, requires you to get the degree correct. Because if you see me come into the room furious about something and you say, I can see you're a little upset, that might make me even more mad. Um, so using uh, care, you, using caution when choosing the degree of language um, is more advanced. So you can try this, but you can also um, just ask, how are you feeling? Um, or are you wanting more appreciation for your work than you've received? What are others requesting? Are you needing reassurance that everyone is contributing significantly? Remember we talked about Tyler, They're, they were quote unquote lazy slash they were only spending 20 minutes working on something while everyone else was spending two hours. Uh, maybe someone on that team comes up and says, hey, Tyler isn't contributing um, and I feel pretty upset about it. We might ask them, are you wanting more frequent updates about adjustments to the project? Because Tyler has a new role, which only allows them to do 20 minutes with you. Um, or are you needing reassurance that everyone's contributing significantly? Because I know that even though Tyler only did 20 minutes on this day, Tyler has been doing lots of work um, unpaid on the weekend uh, to make up for their availability during the week or something. Hopefully they are not doing any unpaid work, but that is neither here nor there. Are you guys laughing at my jokes? <laughs> That's okay. Can I go back to the last slide for a second? I can, Angeline. Clear, concrete, current, and positive action language. I hope this is the right slide. Yeah, no problem. So let's look at my handy dandy sentence starter for nonviolent communication and a conflict. Observation, when I see that you don't respond to my emails um, before the end of the day, I feel concerned because my need for order uh, before, the, before the next week is not met. 
would you be willing to uh, shoot me an email when you leave for the day so that I know not to expect an email for you, from you? Or would you be willing to email within 24 hours uh, while you're working this, in this role? When I see that you arrive after the start time, I feel anxious because my need for order is not met. Most of these come down to order. Would you be willing to leave 30 minutes earlier next time to ensure that you arrive on time? Or shoot me a email or Slack message before uh, you're tardy so that I can know what to expect. How are these feeling for y'all? Awesome, thanks for the thumbs up. All right, let's do a quick activity. Actually, due to time, if you would like to screenshot this activity and do it, you're welcome to. I wanna make sure that we have some time to do Q and A. Um, but basically in this activity, you write three complaints and you private message me, but you won't have me. So you can just write them down and then look at those complaints and try to guess what the dream, wish or need behind that complaint is. Oftentimes we're, we're receiving a lot of messages from folks uh, who are in pain. They're hurting, they're sad, they're frustrated, and they just need their needs met. But we want to figure out what those needs really are. Um, what are the dreams? What are the wishes? What are the needs behind the complaints that, that are coming out? That one of the examples I have is you're always late. That's a really classic complaint. This kind of deteriorates uh, uh, relationships. Um, so learning how to listen for what's underneath the complaint and responding to that rather than uh, reacting to it can really help um, ease tension, reduce conflict, and help us connect and remember the humanity in others. So just to review, we learned about observations versus evaluations um, and how to really talk about what we're seeing and hearing um, in a specific situation. We learned a little bit about the human needs that connect all of us, um, which helps ground us in an empathetic approach because we really wanna focus on uh, recognizing the, that everyone is looking to get their needs met and trying to find a way to compromise and create a win-win scenario for everyone. And then we have feelings, all about feelings. We love to feel, I'm giving you a little shimmy shrug, what is, it, what is this called? Is this just a shimmy? But we all love to feel. Um, and so thinking about how we can get our feeling, uh, how we can talk about what's alive in us in a way that is compelling and helps others recognize our humanity. And lastly, making requests, putting all those three together to ask someone uh, to help us meet our needs. Um, I thought I saw something there, but I didn't. I would like to read you one of my favorite quotes from Marshall B. Rosenberg, um, where he says, if I use nonviolent communication to liberate people to be less depressed, to get along better with their family, but do not teach them at the same time to use their energy to rapidly transform systems in the world, then I am a part of the problem. I'm essentially calming people down, making them happier to live in the systems as they are. So I am using NBC as a narcotic. Um, I think this is important because this is not just about uh, strengthening interpersonal communication. Nonviolent communication is more than strengthening interpersonal communication. Nonviolent communication is a way for us to uh, recognize um, everyone's full humanity and offer them an opportunity to meet us in the fields that Rumi described, in a place outside of wrongdoings and right doing meet us in a field to discuss how we can create win-win solutions. Um, so thank you all so much. I really enjoyed ranting to you about one of my favorite things. Um, I love nonviolent communication. I have more in-depth uh, workshops available. So you're welcome to visit me on my website, khadijahmeans.com, on LinkedIn, khadijahmeans123, or on Instagram at khadijahmeans. It used to be at means khadijah, but it's actually at khadijahmeans. I'm going to stop my screen share, I think. Hello, I can see you. This is great. It's hard to talk to no one. <laughs> Thanks, Khadija. That was really awesome. 
That's, um, I know we had the one question from Hannah on the hierarchy of needs and how that related to um, the uh, needs that you had in yours, in your slide. Totally. Um, thank you so much for that question, Hannah. So one thing about nonviolent communication that's beautiful um, is that it's trying to help us recognize our unmet needs. Um, but of course, there are many needs um, in the Maslow hierarchy of needs is talking about um, our basic needs, food, water, shelter, and that we need to allocate a lot of time and energy uh, to getting those met. And if we don't have those met, we can't focus on anything else. We can't focus on emotional fulfillment. Um, we can only focus on making sure we have a place to sleep and uh, food and water to drink. Um, so that connects to nonviolent communication in that we can recognize that folks don't have space or energy to um, empathize with us while they are focused on feeding themselves. Um, and it's, it's such a hard, excuse me, um, thinking about the hierarchy of needs makes me very sad for my people, Black people, Black queer women, um, and thinking about how often our, our days are filled with focus on um, just meeting our basic needs uh, because of systemic racism and the pay gap and so many other things. Um, so nonviolent communication is beautiful because it can give you this opportunity to eliminate so much conflict in your life, which can save you so much time. Uh, but it's, it's hard because who has access to learning those skills, to practicing, um, are folks who have free time, which means that the folks on, focused on that bottom tier of meeting their needs are not able to get there. Um, and that's why um, I said what I said about empathizing with those who don't have the skills. Um, not because of pity, but rather always focusing on trying to listen to what's underneath uh, how someone's communicating with you, not focused so much on what they're literally saying, but focusing on connecting with them, on really hearing where they're coming from and what's coming up for them. Does that answer that question at all? Yeah, that answers that question amazingly. Thanks, Hannah. Mm -hmm. um, this is a whirlwind of a week. I'm feeling a little bit off these days, especially with all of the chaos happening in our world and the continuous grief of a global pandemic. Um, but I love to share anything I know about nonviolent communication um, because I think that it can liberate all of us. Um, and I think that it's so important for uh, companies and companies because they're comprised of people uh, to focus on what it means to connect with other folks, um, with other people. Any more questions? We have one minute left. That's enough for at least one more question. There's a question from Jack. He wants to know how I can get a list of the books you mentioned about nonviolent communication. Um, he wants to learn more. Awesome. I would love to mention more books. Um, ben, is it possible for me to send you a list that you can email out after this? I yeah, will send a resources list. No. Awesome. I definitely want to send um, the MVC at work tool out because I find that to be one of the best everyday tools uh, for practicing nonviolent communication. It gives you two options, either complaint to core value or initial feeling to underlying need. And you can select either one of those and it gives you um, so many options. There's words like manipulated, attack. And when you click on them, for example, if you click on attack, it'll tell you that uh, there's fear, anger, sadness, um, coming up. Um, and you can also look at the needs um, as well. I can't, I don't have those off the top of my head, but uh, they're very helpful in helping us communicate with others and helping others to uh, recognize um, what's, what's really alive in them rather than uh, trying to make us feel guilty for attacking them, et cetera. Before we close, can I please read a poem from this is from Nonviolent Communication, A Language of Life by Marshall Rosenberg. Um, and it is by Ruth Bebermeyer. Um, words are windows or they're walls. I feel so sentenced by your words. I feel so judged and sent away. Before I go, 
I've got to know, is that what you mean to say? Before I rise to my defense, before I speak in hurt or fear, before I build that wall of words, tell me, did I really hear? Words are windows or their walls. They sentence us or set us free. When I speak and when I hear, let the love light shine through me. There are things I need to say, things that mean so much to me. If my words don't make me clear, will you help me to be free? If I seem to put you down, if you felt I didn't care, try to listen through my words to the feelings that we share. Iconic, so iconic. Thank you so much, Ruth. Thank you all for your time. Um, I hope that you enjoyed that poem. Uh, check out Nonviolent Communication, A Language of Life. Um, I have a couple other recommendations. Say What You Mean is a great book as well. Do I have anything planned for self-care tonight? I'm going to drink some tea and hopefully get a foot massage. That's all I can hope. <laughs> Thank you all and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Khadija. And thanks everybody for spending um, your last hour of the workday with us. Um, if you're interested in tuning in to any more, we have a couple more uh, webinar series that are going on one tomorrow uh, that focuses on creating supportive ecosystems for BIPOC owned businesses, um, specifically in our area. Um, that's going to be at noon, so feel free to check that out. Again, this will be on our Facebook and our YouTube. Um, so if you want to refer back to the recording, uh, definitely check back there, um, as well as all the other sessions are recorded there as well. Uh, thanks everybody again and hope everybody has a great rest of their afternoon.